Alrighty. So, I got a little fancy with some of my sermon points tonight. I did a little bit of alliteration. So we have rejection to reconciliation, perseverance over pride, and the mystery of mercy. Some of you are like, ooh, I like that. I like alliteration. And some of you are like, what's the point? That is the point. I made a pun. Some of you like puns. Apparently not a lot of you. So where we left off last week, though, um, was Paul speaking to the Jews in the previous passage, and he was communicating that Israel is a, rev- is a remnant. Um, and Dr. Nisbet did a really great job of explaining that, that nothing really has changed um, in regards to, to God and his salvation for Israel, and that, that there's always been a remnant, and there's always been times when, when Israel as a whole rejected God, but there's always, even in those times, there's been people who were still faithful to God, and that's how God brought um, all of his promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob um, through to this point. And as Dr. Nisbet said, God hasn't forgotten about them. Everything's still right on track. And so in, chapter, uh, in this section of chapter 11, Paul begins to switch his, uh, his focus less from the Jews, but more speaking directly to the Gentiles at this point. Um, and so in our first section of this passage, we're going to look at Paul's explanation to the Gentiles as to how the unbelieving Jews' rejection of Christ brings salvation to the Gentiles, and then coming back full circle, back to the Jews again. Um, so we're going to read our first section here, verses, chapter 11, verses 11 through 16. And we do have it on U, U version tonight, too, if you, any of you guys are using that. So it says, So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, though, their trespass, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you, Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. And so we can see in this section repeatedly, Paul talks about how Israel as a whole has rejected God, but he still has a plan to come back to them, to bring salvation back to them again, even though they've rejected him. And so that's why our first point tonight is rejection to reconciliation. And so let's just kind of walk through the text here. And so in verse 11, it says, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. So Paul explains here that there is still hope for the Israelites, even though though they've been hardened and their their condition is not irreversible. They can still be saved. And so then looking at verse 12, it says, Now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? And so in this verse, Israel's rejection of the gospel does not mean that they are fully excluded. It doesn't mean that they're fully excluded from God's salvation or anything like that. All it means is that the gospel has more readily fell on more fertile soil with the Gentiles. And so God's focus of salvation has therefore went to the Gentiles because the Jews as a whole have rejected the gospel, right? And so when Paul says their failure means the riches of the world, uh, essentially what he's saying is that because Israel rejected the Messiah, rejected the apostles when they brought the gospel, rejected all of these things, it simply forced Paul and other apostles like them to take the gospel somewhere else, right? Um, Mr. Nisbet last week mentioned that, that Paul was beaten and thrown out of all of these cities in Israel, and, and many other apostles were too. Stephen was stoned and killed, right? And so the Israel's, Israelites just as a whole rejected the gospel. And so because of this, God's people, apostles of the gospel, naturally just moved out to different places, and they moved out naturally to the Gentiles. And so they spread the gospel to the Gentiles. And so in a way, this was a natural uh, occurrence, a natural occurrence that had to happen for the gospel to be spread as rapidly as it was to the rest of the world. Uh, because some might argue that if, if, uh, if the Israelites had accepted the gospel and, and fully accepted Jesus as the Messiah, um, the Israelites may have done essentially kind of what they always did, which was kind of fail in a lot of regards. And so they may have just continued to not be a light to the world. They may have continued to be steeped in hypocrisy. And they may have continued to, to take for granted the blessings of God. And so the gospel wouldn't have been spread quite as fast as it was in, uh, in the beginning of the church here. And so this was kind of a necessary thing to happen. But even amidst this, God hasn't given up on the Jews. 
right? Verse 12, their failure means riches for the Gentiles. How much more will their full inclusion mean? So God hasn't forgotten about the Jews. It's just that the Gentiles are ready to accept the gospel, and so God's people are bringing it to them quicker, right? And so Paul essentially says the same thing in verses 13 through 15. He says, now if I'm speaking to you Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? And so again, Paul here is, is talking about how the Israelites have rejected God, but he still says, their acceptance will will be even greater. And so God is still, even in their rejection, he's looking for reconciliation with his people. God hasn't forgotten about his people. Even though they've rejected him, God's still working and has a plan for reconciliation. And this plan is a little funny, right? Because in verse 14, it says that Paul magnifies his ministry in order to make the Jews jealous, right? So it's kind of of a little funny. So it's like, well, I'm going to make this look really good here, and then you're going to want it back. But we know human nature, right? Grass is always greener on the other side. Or as soon as something gets taken away from us, we're like, whoa, I kind of wanted that back, right? And so Paul's just, he's doing this, and this is part of God's plan to bring the Jews back to him again. He hasn't forgotten about his people. Verse 16 says, If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Um, So Paul notes that the Jewish people are still holy to God. In, in a general sense, not that every single one of them is. Um, and in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that he becomes all things to all people in hopes that he will save as many as possible. Now, that's a super cool verse, um, and, and that kind of ties into what he's doing here. He, he's magnifying his ministry to the Gentiles in hopes that the Jews will be jealous and then come to Christ even more, right? And so, I was trying to think of kind of an illustration of this, and so you guys are going to get a little, a little insight into uh, Hannah and I's relationship when we first started dating. And so 17-year-old Nathaniel um, was not looking for anything serious at all. But 17-year-old Nathaniel still wanted to take a really pretty girl to prom. And so he asked the prettiest girl to prom. She said, yes, it was Hannah. Um, and so... <laughs> And so we went to prom, and, and as I'm trying to convince myself that I don't want anything serious with this girl, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, I'm devising a plan, and I'm like, you know, I'm just going like, to dance with her a few times, and, and then I'll you know, dance with some other people just to like, kind of make that you know, just kind of evident there, right? And so we get to prom, and, and she's beautiful, and, and we're dancing like every song together, and we're not like ever even leaving each other's sides. And, um, and I'm, I start to realize, like, oh, this is not my plan. Like, I'm not following the plan, right? <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so at one point, kind of a mutual friend of ours um, came up and, and kind of butted in and was like, hey, could I, could, I, could I dance with you, Hannah? And she's like, okay. And so I'm like, oh, okay, cool, cool. So I kind of you know, stand back, and I'm like, all right, I don't, this is, you know, this is fine. This is fine. And so, you know, I try to, like, walk over, and I'm, like, getting a drink, and I keep looking over, and I'm like, hey, that's my girl. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, I, I realize what I had, and, and, and I wanted it back again, right? And so I went over, and what's a dancing song, like, three and a half, four minutes most at max? I didn't even make it through half of the song with them dancing. I went and cut in again. Hey, sorry. <laughs> this is my date. <laughs> And so essentially, it's essentially that, that's what Paul's doing here with the Jews, right? <laughs> essentially, that's the same thing. He's, making them, he's trying to make them jealous. He's trying to, to show them what they had, what they could have had, in order that they'll want it back. And, and human nature, that works, right? Playing hard to get, that works, right? Seeing what we could have had and we don't have anymore, that works. And so that's what Paul's doing here. And he's saying, I magnify my ministry so that the Jews will become jealous and then want the blessings of God back. Um, so rejection to reconciliation. And so the point of this section here, I think, is that, that God does not give up on his people, right? His people, the Jews as a whole, have rejected God, but he's still working through Paul. He's still working through, God is working through these different avenues to bring his people back to him. He's still working through a plan to bring his people that have rejected him back and reconcile them to him. And I just want to kind of point out these as we go. So verse 11, in order that they might stumble, that they might fall, by no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Verse 12, uh, if their trespass means riches, their failure means riches, how much more will their full inclusion be? Verse 14, 
in order to make the Jews somehow jealous and thus save some of them. Verse 15, their acceptance will mean, but li- will mean life from the dead. And then in verse 16, he talks about how the dough offered is, is holy and so is the whole lump. And so all throughout this, even though Paul is talking about how Israel has rejected God, he still goes back to the fact that God is working through that rejection for the reconciliation of his people. And so speaking of first fruits, uh, this is kind of a common thread through the Bible is, is the first fr- fruits of salvation. You may see that a lot in the New Testament. Um, New Testament, not plural. <laughs> so the first fruits uh, of the gospel were still Jews. Um, even though Israel as a whole rejected God, the first fruits of the gospel were Jews, right? It was people like Paul, the apostles, um, Mary and Martha, people that followed around Jesus throughout his entire ministry. But even with some of the first fruits of the gospel, um, there were some that still didn't believe and, and rejected Christ in a sense. Um, how many of you guys think of, uh, think of, think of Doubting Thomas, right? Um, Doubting Thomas. He was an apostle. He followed Jesus around his entire ministry, right? And at first, at first thought, you might be like, man, like, that dude probably did a lot of good stuff, but he's known for the rest of his life, the rest of like, the world, as the Doubting Thomas, right? That one thing that he did, right? That's pretty horrible. But at the same time, I, I think it's kind of cool because it shows the humanity of of, of him, of Thomas. It shows the humanity of even those who followed around Jesus and saw his miracles and, and saw all of these things that Jesus did and, and knew that he was God, knew that he was the Son of God, and still Thomas doubted. And so he rejected God in a sense. He said, no, I can't, I can't believe it. I can't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And so what did God do? God didn't say, well, you should have believed me because you saw me do all these miracles. You should have known from everything I said that I was going to rise from the dead. I'm done with you now. No. What did God do? Jesus, the God of creation, came and met Thomas where he was at in his doubts, and he showed him what he needed to believe. From rejection to reconciliation, God doesn't give up on his people. In his infinite and unfathomable mercy, he can take our rejection after rejection after rejection and turn it and work it into a reconciliation to him. Rejection to reconciliation. So we're going to jump into our next section here, verses 17 through 24. So we'll read that real quick. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. And remember, Paul is speaking mainly to the Gentiles here. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? And so in this section, Paul is still speaking to the Gentiles, but less explaining his, his plan for the Jews and more of a warning. So now he's like, hey, so this is my plan for the Jews. Yes, they've rejected me as a whole. Yes, the gospel has come to you more rapidly, but don't be prideful in that. Don't be prideful in that. And so Paul uses this metaphor of an olive tree, right? And this, this, this metaphor of the olive tree has very strong Old Testament roots in, in Jeremiah and, and the book of Hosea. Um, and it's also a little bit reminiscent of, of Jesus' uh, teachings of the vine and the branches, right? And you kind of you see the, the similarities there, right? Um, so I want to kind of go through and, and, and look at which, which part is, is what and just kind of uh, define everything, and then we'll work our way through. And so the roots are the patriarchs. When we look at the, the root, it says that the root supports you um, in verse 18. So the root is the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These, these are the men that God gave his, his covenant promises to, that Jesus would come through their lineage and, and all of these things. And so the root is the patriarchs. And then, then the tree is God's people from both Old and New Testaments. All believers, share, all believers that are connected to the tree share in the benefits of the roots. 
And then the branches are both Jews and Gentiles. Um, but you'll notice the branches are not supposed to uh, be taken as, as like all of Israel or like all of the Gentiles. The branches are to be taken as, as individual believers. Um, and so this passage, again, is a warning to the Gentiles as much as Romans 9 is a warning to the Israelites, um, to, to the Jewish believers. And so Paul is warning the Gentiles against spiritual pride here. And so he kind of he goes back and forth, and he almost like covers every single base ever here, right? In, in these verses, he's like, well, the Jews are broken off, and so you're grafted in, but don't take pride because you could be cut back off. And if the Jews you know, start believing again, then how much more easily will they be grafted on? But if you continue in your belief, you'll stay there. And so he's like, back and forth, back and forth, right? But he, he's covering all of these bases here, and he's, essentially what he's saying is, is don't take pride in the fact that you have been grafted in. Because it's nothing that you've done. You've been grafted into the tree. The roots, the the Jewish roots, the covenants, the patriarchs are what support you. And so don't be prideful over the Jews. It's not that you're smarter or that you know more about God or that you understand things better. You're grafted in by faith, just the same as, as the Jews will be if they come back. Verse 20, that is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith, so do not become proud, but fear. And so our point for this section here is perseverance over pride. Perseverance over pride. And I want to run through some key points in this section here. And so verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. And so here we see that the Gentiles were grafted in. So this is a salvation that was not originally theirs. And so he's saying, hey, like, Don't take pride in this. This salvation is not originally yours. You've been grafted in by faith. Verse 18, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. And so the Gentiles are dependent on the root. Again, another warning, you are dependent on the patriarchs, the covenants, the law, all of the things that came through the Jews. The Messiah came through the Jews. And so don't be proud against the Jews because... They're the ones, essentially, that are supporting the tree. Then looking at verse 22, note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And so here we see that the Gentiles must continue in faith to be saved. If they disbelieve, they'll be cut off just as easily as the Jews were cut off. And so Paul's saying, you are no better than the Jews. The Jews are no better than you. The difference is believing faith, right? And so then in verse 23, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. The back and forth just gets me, but so in this section, we see if an unbelieving Jew does not persist in their unbelief, he or she can be grafted back in again. And so overall, what this passage is, is kind of leading to and pointing to is a message against spiritual pride, a message against spiritual pride. So perseverance over pride, perseverance in faith, perseverance in belief over spiritual pride. And so Paul war- is warning the Gentiles, and in, in verse 18, he's, he's, saying, he's saying all these things, he's warning them against their uh, spiritual pride. Um, If we look at verses 20 and 21, it says, That is true, they were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith, so do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. The Gentiles are grafted in because of faith alone. The Jews are grafted back in because of faith alone. There is no difference here. And and essentially Paul is saying that if, if they... If they cease to believe, they'll be cut off just as quick as the natural branches. Um, Verse 22 kind of supports just the the perseverance of the saints. Um, And throughout the New Testament, we see that that continuance is often a sign of, uh, uh, or a test of reality, right? Um, Think about Jesus's parable with the the seed scattered on the different soils, right? Um, Some of the seed was was scattered, I can't say scattered, scattered. It was scattered on, uh, on loose th- soil, right? And it, and it sprouted up really quick, right? And it, w- it was growing really good. And then when the sun came out and the hard times came, essentially, they withered up and died. And so continuance is a proof of reality or a test of reality. And, and, uh, and that's kind of the, 
what is being, what is being said here. And so perseverance over pride. And so essentially what's going on here in this section is, um, how many of you guys have siblings? Oh man, almost everybody. Okay. So how many times can you guys remember like something happened, like, and your parents are ticked and they sit you all down and they're like, you know that you might, like you have a pretty good chance of like getting grounded or spanking or whatever, like you're in trouble. But then they like sort of hone in on like your other sibling and you're like, yes, got him. <laughs> like I'm free, right? Right? And they hone in on them and they're like, oh, you know, you're, you know, you're in trouble, you're doing this and like they get into big trouble and you're just kind of sitting there and you got that smirk, right? And that's essentially what's going on here because Paul's been chastising the, the Jews, the Jewish Christians, the Jews who rejected God. He's been chastising them pretty, pretty hard all, all the way throughout this. And so essentially what's going on is the Gentiles are over there and they got that little smirk on their face, right? And they're like, huh, yep, we're better than them. And so Paul like turns over to them. He's like, whoa, 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 I haven't gotten to you yet. I haven't gotten to you yet, right? And we've all heard that with the parents, right? They, you're disciplining the one sibling and then they're like, whoa, I haven't gotten to you. And you're like, oh, darn. Okay, I thought I was getting off scot-free. And so essentially that's what's happening here is Paul is saying, no, like, Yes, I'm chastising the Jews because as a whole, they've rejected Messiah. But don't take pride in the fact that the gospel has come to you more readily. Don't take pride in this. Don't be prideful over others, over the Jews, because there is no difference between you. God shows no partiality. The only way to get connected to the vine, get connected to the olive tree, is through faith. Is through believing faith. And so... One thing that's important here is, is this, conditional, this conditional phrase here in, in, uh, in verse 23. It says, And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. I'm sorry, 22. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. It's a conditional clause there, right? And so provided you continue in his kindness. Uh, this is a harsh reminder that there is no continuing guarantee of God's mercy and grace in spite of apostasy. There's no guarantee of God's grace if we cease to believe. There's no, there's no guarantee of grace if we no longer have faith in God. And so the fact is here is that pride is a rejection of God. Faith is not, not a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding, but is, it is in part, a huge part in relation to saving faith, is, is a humbling of oneself in an understanding of knowing I can't do this on my own. There's nothing that I've done to get God's grace. There's nothing I can do to earn God's grace because that's not grace. You can't earn grace. And so that's why pride here is, is hit on so strongly because pride is a rejection of God perseverance over pride. And so Paul reminds them not to be prideful because they've been grafted in only through faith the same way as the Jews. And so in the same way, my friends, we have to be on guard from Satan's attacks as well. We have to be on guard from Satan's attacks of pride, spiritual pride in our lives. Now, if you think of Satan, he fell from heaven because of pride, right? He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be equals. He wanted to be above God. And the same distance that Satan now has from God will be ours as well if we choose our pride over our perseverance of our faith and our perseverance of our belief. Perseverance over pride. We must get rid of any pride within us. We have to realize, the same way as the Gentiles here, being kind of scolded a little bit, we have to realize that, that we're no better than anybody else. We don't have salvation because we're smarter we don't have salvation because we understand God or because we're more philosophical or any of these things or because we've worked hard or anything. We only have salvation because of our faith in Jesus Christ, because of our faith in his sacrifice for us. Perseverance over pride. Moving into our next, our, our third section here tonight, verses 25 through 32. So in this section, Paul furthers his comments on God's continuing mercy to the Jews, and he refers to it as a mystery. And so we'll jump in here, and we'll, we'll read all the way through. Verse 25, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. 
As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts of the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to them, shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And so our last point is the mystery of mercy, the mystery of mercy. And so before we move forward in this section, it's important to note in verse 25, uh, some of you may have caught it and been like, okay, that's a little weird. Some of you kind of maybe just read on through, but it says in this way, all Israel will be saved. Um, It's important to note here that there's a lot of debate on what all Israel means. Um, So I'm just going to kind of go through the the three most common uh, arguments of what all Israel refers to in this passage. Um, So the first one is that all Israel refers to ethnic Israel. And so within this belief, there's kind of two variations. And and people who believe that all Israel here refers to all of ethnic Israel believe that at some point, either before Christ's second coming or when Jesus comes back for the second and last time, um, all Israel, all ethnic Israel will be saved. Um, the second, and, and that one's kind of crazy, but number two, the second one is uh, the belief that all Israel refers to the, ch- to the church. So like spiritual Israel, the terms that we've seen throughout um, um, the book so far have been like true Israel in chapter four. In chapter nine, if you remember, uh, Paul made a distinction between ethnic Israel and the children of promise. And so the children of promise are Gentiles and Jews, all believers in Christ. And so that's the, the second view here. And then the third is all Israel refers to all ethnic Jews who compose spiritual Israel. And so, um, so just kind of getting that out of the way and let you kind of think about that as we go through and we'll, we'll kind of look and open this up a little bit. So verse 25 says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So the mystery Paul is speaking of here is how God will save the Jews. Um, the partial hardening here at the, the second part says a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Um, this partial hardening should, be, should not be taken in terms of God hardened some of the Jews and not the rest, but that kind of like Pharaoh, but in a lesser degree, a partial hardening was over all of Israel. And again, we kind of alluded to that, that that was kind of a necessary thing to happen for the gospel to be spread all throughout the world. And so the partial hardening made the Jews reject the gospel, reject the Messiah. And so then God's people naturally went out and spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it is rapid. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one of those maps uh, where it's like the, the, it'll like have a different color of something like as a religion expands or something. And like for the first couple hundred years um, after Jesus, if you see like on the map, it's like starts in Israel and just kind of like slowly and then just like explodes over like all of the known world. Um, And it's really cool. And so that was a necessary thing. And so that's what this partial hardening is. But it's not forever. It's also not, it's also temporary, as we can see, because it says until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So this hardening isn't, uh, isn't uh, permanent or, or final or anything like that. It's, so it's both in terms of degree, partial, and also temporary. Um, So moving on into verse 26, and in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written, Um, The interpretation that concludes all Israel means all of ethnic Israel will be saved is pretty inconsistent with the rest of Scripture, namely the rest of Romans. Um, Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 9, and multiple other places, Romans chapter 2, we see that that Paul is is making a distinction and and very clearly saying that just because you're ethnically Jewish, it doesn't mean that you'll be saved. It's not a direct correlation here. And so that one's kind of, we can kind of throw that that option out here of what all Israel means. Um, it does seem consistent, however, to say that all Israel here refers to spiritual Israel um, because Paul speaks of the mystery of how God will bring salvation back to the Jews. Um, so there has been a distinction between Gentiles and Jews up to this point in the passage. So this seems pretty likely that, that Paul is simply talking about true Israel or all Israel is simply just talking about like all believers who are ethnically Jewish. Um, And this distinction is kind of made between Gentiles and Israel. And after all, it isn't really a mystery of how God will save the Gentiles, right? Because 
It's through the gospel. And so in the same way, it's not a mystery how God will save the Jews either. And so what this mystery really is that Paul's talking about is how God focuses his his salvation on different areas and different groups of people at different points. And so that's really the mystery that Paul is talking about here. And so the mystery is how he will then bring and use the Gentiles to bring the gospel back to the Jews. Um, And so two major things need to be considered here. First, this passage refers to the fact that God has turned his specific attention towards the Gentiles in reference to his salvation, but Paul is reminding the Gentiles that God has not forgotten about the Jews. And number two, this passage seems to refute those who would say that God is forever done with Israel. Um, And so even in the same way that the apostasy or the rejection of Israel, the rejection of the Messiah, wasn't to every last Jew, in the same way here, when Paul says all Israel— uh, either way, whether it's true Israel or whether it's ethnic Israel that it believes, either way, uh, Paul is speaking of the mass of Jews when he says Israel. In the same way that they didn't all reject the Messiah, they didn't, they're not all saved either. Um, and further, Paul quotes um, here in verses 20, 26 and 27, and he says, The deliverer will come from Zion, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Um, so Paul is quoting this uh, prophetic uh, scripture from Isaiah chapter 27 and chapter 52, uh, 59, I'm sorry, chapter 27 and 59, and it's prophetic of Christ's first coming, not his second coming. And so the distinction here is that if, if, uh, if this was a prophetic reference to Christ's second coming, it would lead us to believe that all ethnic Israel would be saved in the end. But this is of Christ's first coming, and so Israel will be saved in the exact same way that the Gentiles will be saved. So there's not like some different weird way of salvation that God's bringing to the Jews after the Gentiles. It's the same way, through Christ, through faith. Moving on in verse 29, it says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Paul says this to emphasize further that God has not given up on ethnic Israel. Then verses 30 and 31, For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. So Paul emphasizes that in the same way that the Gentiles have been extended mercy by the foundation of God's work in the Jews, God now wants to extend mercy to the Jews once again, except this time through the Gentiles. And so Paul is simply in in verse 32, he says, he finishes this section off and he says, for God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Now that verse right there is a very quick summary of the gospel, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but God has extended his mercy to us, right? And so, but in in the context here, Paul is just stating his understanding of the way God is dealing with Israel. Because of their unbelief, they've experienced a partial hardening until the gospel is spread to to the Gentiles. And then through the Gentiles' salvation, they will then bring salvation back to the Jews. Um... Have, have any of you guys been to one of those, like, escape rooms? Or do you know what I'm talking about, an escape room, right? Pretty cool, right, some of you that have been to one? It's like you, 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 they lock you in a room, and, and there's, like, a, a story. And you got to, like, put together this story, and it's, it's a mystery. And, and you put together this story by finding these different clues, and you'll, you'll find, like a, like, a note, and it says, you know, look in. Or it makes you think of, like, something electrical or something. And so you, like, open the electrical box, and there's, like, a key, and so then you unlock this. And it's, like, this really cool thing. Um, and, and Hannah and I, over Christmas break, we went with her, uh, her family and did one of these escape rooms. And, and we made it out in the time period. It was like under an hour you had to make it out. And, um, and so we did it. We solved the mystery, right? But what was kind of cool about it was like you're rushing around and you're doing all these things and, and everybody's finding different clues at once and you're putting it all together. And so a lot of clues like we found, you know, out of order or, or there were a few that we missed or we didn't quite put together the whole story and so when we made it out, you know, in under an hour, we probably spent another 30, 45 minutes talking to the people who ran the escape room and kind of talking to them and they were filling us in on like the story of like what we were putting together. And they're like, oh yeah, you, you found this clue a little before that one or, or you actually kind of missed this one, but you got it on an accident and stuff like that. And, um, and the reason I bring this up is because it was, it was pretty interesting because in the same way, I feel like God has given us the gospel and he's given us what we need to escape God's wrath right? Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to understand everything in the Bible. It doesn't mean that we're going to understand everything about God. It just doesn't. And, and, 
and that's not to, to take away from the fact that we should seek to understand, that we should seek to have knowledge, and it's not a blind faith, right, that we have, but um, that's become more and more clear to me as we've been going through the book of Romans, is that though I feel like I understand, you know, some theology and, and, and this letter so much better than I ever have before, um, there's still a lot of things that, that I kind of wonder about. There's still a lot of things that I'm a little bit confused about, and in the same way, I feel like even though the Gentiles may not have fully understood God's plan for the Jews, maybe they not, didn't fully understand why God wanted to show them mercy, I feel like we, in the same way, we know what we need to know to have faith in God, right? We know what we need to know about the gospel. We know what we need to know to escape God's wrath. There still may be some mysteries. There still may be some things that we, you know, have on our list of like, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this, this, and this, right? And then I'll, hopefully I'll just understand it instantly. I have kind of a list in my head for that. But what we are called to do now as believers is we are called to persevere in faith, to remain faithful unto death. And that's really, I think, what this chapter kind of centers on tonight is the perseverance of the saints, the perseverance in faith, perseverance in belief in Jesus Christ. Verse 20, I just want to read that real quick of this, of this chapter. It's kind of, the, I feel like, one of the central verses in this, this passage. It says, That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. We must persevere in our faith and not give way to pride, which leads to unbelief. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you now and we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us so much to understand about you. But God, I also want to thank you that there's so much that we don't understand about you. Because if we could understand everything, then, then you wouldn't be such an amazing God. But Lord, I thank you for giving us enough, enough knowledge that, that we need to know to understand the gospel, to understand what we need to understand, to believe in you, to put our faith in you, God and to ultimately to save us from our sins. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.